I was looking through my credit card history. There was a charge for a meal service. It struck me as odd because I don't recall using a meal delivery service. I just looked at my account balance one day and it was about $400 more than I was expecting. I got a call from Wells Fargo's fraud department. They were asking if I had spent about $700 in the last week, and my first thought was probably, but I actually did not at the time because I was pretty poor. That moment when you get that text and that email and that phone call now, it is very scary. You get the alert, sometimes it's informational, sometimes there's an action there. What's happening on the other end that triggered that alert? Is this actually fraud? How do you get that text message? Information is coming from either information that you've directly shared for the relationship, that transaction and experience information second, third, that kind of enriched data that the bank gathers and brings in itself, and fourth, data that is just intelligence data, both broadly as well as very, very narrowly for financial services, even for your locale. Walk me through the bank data then. Um, so you, the bank's data is the data that you've provided the bank, your name, address, social security, birth date, that stuff. Yeah, so it's going to be, so bank data is going to be all the data that the bank has that either you provided to it in the onboarding process when they were going ahead and setting up the accounts or throughout the penance of that relationship. The other data that the bank has, which is absolutely enormous treasure trove, is going to be what's called transaction information. Think about every interaction you've ever had with the bank, every ATM that you've gone to, the amount of money that you usually uh, take out of the ATM, what you usually do at the ATM. Do you usually deposit once a month and take out once a month, take out every single Friday night $100? Now, if you think about all the bundling of services that has happened post Graham Leach Bliley Act, GLBA, post Graham Leach Bliley Act, so post 1999, whereas banks could have insurance, they can offer credit cards and debit cards and home mortgages and car mortgages, uh, you know, car loans and all sorts of uh, different services, mobile apps. Let's just take that for a second. Every bank has one mobile app. Most people have it configured that when you're on the mobile app, it pings your GPS location. Well, you are now sending back to the bank your GPS location. They're able to take that data and look at it one-to-one. -one. What is the address on file? Is, it, is he in the same town, the same home, the same vicinity? Where is he actually? And what is he doing? The third bucket is going to be data that the bank or financial institution actually integrates into its systems. So this is going to be the bank reaching out to its vendors, its suppliers. They could be for credit references, credit checks, cybersecurity information, IP databases, email databases, but it's gonna be information that the bank brings into its own systems to further enrich who you are, what your transactions are all about, what you're doing. The fourth area is gonna be that external data. It's all of that data that is just out there within the fiefdom. So threat intelligence on cybersecurity, threat intelligence on the latest uh, hacks, threat intelligence on the latest scams, and also what is happening, not just globally in every sector, but what is happening within the financial services sector? What is happening within banks that are similarly situated? What is that deep, rich intelligence as to things that it should be looking out there for or be on higher alert for? That's gonna really be that fourth area out there. So they've got all those different data buckets. Um, where does the problem start? What, what, which one of those is triggering the alert? Usually what happens is this, is that there is some variance detected, some deviation from the norm that is detected based off of a hard and fast rule that is written. And it's something that basically pops up an alert within a threshold. So, so let me give you an example. Chris Pearson has purchased a airline ticket to California. He purchased a hotel in California and he made some purchases in California. So we know that he's probably more likely than not there in that locale. At the same time, we see a transaction from a gas station or a Best Buy in New York City. And it's within three hours of transactions that are also in California literally impossible. The banking systems 
internally, right, their internal system and separately that transaction experience information system will say, wow, we don't believe that it's likely Chris can be in place A and place B at the same time based off of velocity, time, and timing. We also have no pre-knowledge that he's supposed to be in New York City. We're going to either flag or block this based off of a few different parameters. It could be based off of my spending limits, spending pattern based off of time. It could be that they let through a $10 charge in New York City or a $1 charge in New York City, but they absolutely do not let through a $1,000 plus charge in New York City. So some different thresholds and some different alerting there. That would be one very, very basic travel rule that I'm sure a lot of us have actually uh, you know, had and felt the pain of. I looked through all the charges and saw that there were you know, taxi rides and restaurants that I had not been to. Flat screen TV from Best Buy. About $750 on bodybuilding.com. Vitamins. A sneaker store in the Bronx. Airline tickets. I don't need protein shakes. I don't eat protein shakes. I obviously don't have very big muscles. A $200 charge at this diner Big Daddy's in the city, which was just a red flag right away. What I also want to talk about is the apps. So people are using Apple Pay and Google Pay and anything else. Are these more secure than a credit or debit card? Any transaction where you're actually physically swiping that credit card and reading the mag strip is going to be the least secure transaction you can make both in person or for what's called card not present online um, as well. So with a swipe, it was really just some data on a magnetic strip that you, you swipe it and it gets read in one direction and then that gets processed and you know that's, that's that. With the chip, what actually happens is there's a two-way process. It reads the value from the chip and it also writes a new value on the chip. Um, and so this makes it you know, way more secure and virtually impossible to copy. And so this was all for security? Yeah, it's around security. Um, I think the major concern that the credit card companies had was around uh, people making copies of cards. So I don't know if you've ever experienced this before. But I know I have. I'll go to like an ATM or something to withdraw some money or you know, swipe at some you know, risque place. And then a week later, you find that your card or your debit card was copied or, and used in some other transaction that you weren't even you know, there or anything like that. Um, that's because it, in the swipe scenario, it's, it's one way. So it's, it's a read. And so they're able to literally copy the swipe and, or the mag magnetic strip um, and then use it anywhere. Um, and so with the chip and card, it made that virtually impossible. We talk about your financial information being stolen. It's not if it's going to be stolen it's when it will be stolen. It is highly, highly organized, literally business structure organized. Can you tell me a little bit about the difference between a hacker and a cyber criminal? Well, I myself, am a, I'm a hacker. 